Hey everybody, welcome to the Financial Freedom Show. My name is Rob Burke, and uh, so welcome. We're going to proposal. It has a lot of provisions that have significant potential consequences for investors. I mean, the backdoor Roth, frankly, as you'll see, I think is kind of a minor. It's the footnote. I mean, it gets a lot of attention from the press, but I think the reality is there are much, much bigger changes that will affect investors. And that's, and that's all investors. You know, not, you don't have to be multimillionaire for this to affect you. If you're saving in an IRA or a 401k and, you know, you're just trying to make, it, make enough uh, um, income to eventually retire one day, it will affect you. The, probably the sig most significant change, or one of them, is an increase in the taxes that corporations would pay from 21% to, I think it's 20, is it 26 and a half? Something like that. Yeah, I think it's 26 and a half. That's a pretty significant impact to after-tax earnings will have a, a big impact on valuations. Uh, but having said all that, I will get to the chat in just a minute. I see folks saying hello and hello to you. I do want to jump right into the topic and uh, then we'll get to Q&A. So here's the deal. As you know, uh, the Biden administration you know, wants some big changes to the tax code. And uh, some folks in Washington, uh, specifically the House Ways and Means Committee, uh, has, has sort of put out a proposal. Now, this is not law. It, you know, it's not been voted on even. It's not passed the House even. This is a proposal. It doesn't give President Biden everything he wants. It's certainly a partisan proposal in the sense that I, I would assume there would, there would not be a single Republican uh, that would vote for it. I, by the way, that doesn't make it good or bad. I'm just kind of giving you the, the, the framework. I'm going to keep politics out of this. It's kind of hard to because, I mean, the politics affect our, our pocketbook. I mean, that's just the reality. But I'm, I'm going to keep the, you know, is this good or bad eh, for another, that's for a different YouTube channel. So let me show you the document. Here it is. And it's, as I said, there's a link to this document below the video. And uh, there's a lot going on in here. We're going to actually fast forward. I think it's page uh, 11. Let's see if I can get there quickly. And um, here we go, right there. Uh, tax treatment of rollovers to Roth IRA accounts. Now, let me first kind of set the stage. A long, long time ago, you could not convert a traditional IRA to a Roth IRA if you made too much money. You, you probably know that there are income limits uh, to contributing directly to a Roth IRA. If you make too much money, you're out of luck. You can't open up a Roth IRA and contribute money to it. I'm looking at the numbers now for 2021. For single taxpayers, it's 125,000. It phases out and then you can't contribute anything once you hit 140. Numbers are larger for, for married filing jointly. Uh, but there used to be income limits on conversions as well. And a law that was, that, that was passed in 05, 05, I actually think it was signed into law in 06, did away with those income limits on Roth conversions effective 2010. All right, so you get to 2010 and you know Warren Buffett, <laughs> I don't know, do you think he has an IRA? I don't know, anyway. If he has one, he can convert it to a Roth IRA. Right? There's, there's no income limits, right? So that's sort of the backdrop. Now, uh, what the proposal is, is to change that. So let's take a look at the document. And um, the effects on what I'll call backdoor uh, Roth IRAs are different than what are called mega backdoor Roth IRAs. I'll get to that in a minute. So here's the provision or the proposal on backdoor Roth IRAs. It's right here. There's a couple things to note about it. First of all, it only applies, again, this is just a proposal, but it only applies for folks, single, uh, tax, single taxpayers with incomes over 400 grand. You can see that right here. Oop, right it, there. All right. And let me see if I can make this a little bigger. Uh, whoops, too big. There we go. And if you're married filing jointly, you can make up to 450000 So for a lot of folks, this would have no impact at all, right? Um, I can tell you it, wouldn't, it would not impact me. I wish it would, <laughs> but in any event. Um, the other thing that's interesting is look at this last sentence. This provision applies to distributions, transfers, and contributions made in taxable years beginning after December 31st. That's not a typo. 2031. What? Yeah, I'll tell you, I'll tell you why I think that that's the case. You might think, well, that's awfully nice of them. Uh, the smart folks in Washington are giving us a decade to sort of plan for this big change. No, 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 no. They're not interested in our planning. I can assure you of that. Um, all right. So, so I think, I think the big news about the death of 
backdoor Roth IRAs is that for most people, it's not any news at all. All right, that's my opinion. I, I do, I get that it'll affect some people, no, no question, but it won't affect, affect most people. Now, um, let's talk about the mega backdoor Roth. So uh, the idea here was you could contribute after tax uh, dollars. So you're going to pay tax on the money and then you're going to contribute it to uh, like a 401k. So you've got your first, whatever the limit is. What is it this year? I don't even know. 19.5, whatever it is. Um, but you can then contribute more beyond that. And it's after tax, but you can contribute to a 401k if the plan allows it. And then some plans allow you to then take that money, even while you work, still working there, and basically put it into an IRA and then um, convert it to a Roth. And the limits for this kind of contribution are much larger than for a traditional IRA. And so you're talking tens of thousands of dollars a year. And so that's why they call it mega, mega backdoor Roth. And for that, they're going to completely kill it. If this becomes law, you can see it right here, right here. Furthermore, I'm reading from this line right here. This section prohibits all employee after-tax contributions in qualified plans, which is a fancy word for things like a 401k, contributions in qualified plans and prohibits after-tax IRA contributions from being converted to Roth regardless of income level. Now, what's interesting about that is this one's effective in, in December 31, 2021. But this one's 2031. Now, is that a typo? I guess it could be. Maybe it's a typo. Maybe they didn't proofread this document very well. I don't think so. So here's the deal. In the House, in order for a bill to pass, it's got to pa the CBO scores it, which is a fancy way of saying, how will this impact the deficit? And there are arcane rules, which I won't even pretend that I understand them because I don't. Um, that are followed to score a statute, you know, a bill. And it has to pass certain thresholds or there's problems. Yeah. And um, what, what, the, um, what they do is they look at, at, at a 10-year period. And I know what you're thinking. You're saying, wait a minute. They protect the deficit, sort of, for 10 years. But if in year 11, the statute completely wrecks the deficit, that's okay. But they just focus on the first 10 years. And the answer is, yeah, that's exactly, that's exactly what they do. Um, and so the, the problem with getting rid of a backdoor Roth IRA from this scoring perspective, by the way, this is all conjecture. I could prove to be wrong. For all I know, it's just a typo. Um, it, will, it will push revenue that would have occurred in this decade, right? If, if this rule went into effect tomorrow, it would push revenue that would have occurred in this decade, not from a backdoor Roth where someone converts money that's already been taxed, but remember this the whole conversion, a lot of folks convert um, money that was, was deductible in an IRA. In fact, I just talked about this the other day in what's called a Roth IRA conversion ladder, right? So a lot of this triggers taxes. But if you can't do it, or at least if the rich people can't do it, and presumably they have pretty fat IRAs, then when does the government get their money? Well, decades from now, when, when these rich people retire and then they have RMDs and it slowly pours into the government's coffers over the next two, three, four decades. So it's going to push revenue that would have occurred this decade into future decades. Well, that can be a problem when scoring the statute. So what they said was, no, no, no worries. We'll just delay for 10 years and then it'll take effect. That's my hunch. So um, anyway, regardless, that's what the document says. 2031, whether my hunch is right or wrong or for all I know, that's a typo. Um, that's what it says. And so that's the deal. I think, again, the upshot is mega backdoor Roths, I think, would be over. Backdoor Roths, I think, would not be over for most people, would be, would be over for others. Now, there are other provisions that affect retirement accounts. Raise your hand if you have $10 million or more in an IRA. I can assure you my hand is not going up. But if that's you, um, you can't contribute anymore. Sorry, you're going to have to live with the $10 million in your IRA. And your RMDs are going to get really, really rich. I think it's 50% for the amounts over $10 million bucks. Uh, so I think there's like seven people in the world that that affects, something like that. I don't know what the number is. It's, it's kind of, I, I get it from a, just a, I don't know, a policy perspective. Why should someone that has that much keep putting more in? I don't know, whatever. But as a practical matter, it's not going to affect anyone. I mean, it's going to affect a few people. I don't know what the number is yet. I don't know if they've tried to, I don't know if anyone knows the exact number. But if you think about it, you know, there are contribution limits to 401ks and IRAs. And so 
you know, you can only put so much in there. Yes, you can convert money, but you know, it's got to come from a retirement account somewhere. I suppose maybe you had a, dev a defined benefit plan, otherwise known as a pension, and it got really fat and then you rolled, converted it. I mean, maybe, uh, but even that, it would be hard to get 10 million for most people. Um, obviously, Peter Thiel, you know, was sort of big news because he had stock of whatever in his Roth IRA and now it's worth a trillion dollars, but you know, whatever. I'm not sure I would personally would set policy based on, on him, but maybe that's why I'm not a politician. So there you go. That's the deal. Like I said, there's a lot more in this document, frankly, that affect investors. I have not read the whole thing. I've read the highlights. Um, and it's not law. Who knows what will end up happening? Um, but there you go. That's the deal. All right. So that was quick and painless. It was just 10 minutes. So I, I want, I'm going to check the chat and read all your great questions, but um, I do have a question for you first. If, if, is that allowed? Can I ask you guys a question? I'm actually going to open this um, live stream up, and then I'm going to mute it and then check out the chat through YouTube. I normally don't do this. All right. Uh, I've got another tool over here so, um, that, that shows me the chat. All right. So my question to you is this. I am going to start doing videos that look at tools. It could be a calculator. You know, it could be personal capital, new retirement. There's one called Ripsaw that I'm checking out. Um, it could be a, a, an iPhone or Android app. Um, and maybe, I don't know, one a week, one every other week. But I'm going to kind of review it, show you what it's like, what it does, what it doesn't do. Good, bad, ugly. And I'm curious, are there any tools, calculators, whatever, that you would like me to cover or, you know, and or that you have been using and you just think are awesome uh, and that I should look into? That's my question. While you're answering that, I didn't, uh, I got a question here about trusts, which I didn't look at. So, and that's going to be complicated. So I'm going to have to, I'll have to dive into the trust issue. I'll do that. I know it has to do with the state planning, right? I'll have to look at it. Anyway, that's my question for you guys. What tools should I be looking at? Robo investor. Okay. I've used in the past Betterment um, and Wealthfront. Those are the two robo advisors I've used. I had a SEP IRA at Wealthfront, and I think I just had a taxable account at Betterment. This was years ago. My goodness. Well, I met John Stein, who founded Betterment in 2011 at a conference. I think it was shortly after that. So it's a while ago. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm making a note. I think robo-advisors, I think they're great tools. I, I really do. Um, and it obviously costs a little bit of money, usually around 25 basis points. But I think they're a great way to invest. Um, so I got that. Thanks, Salty. All right, let's see what else we've got. The 1040 estimator. All right. Let me make a note of that. I'm making notes in, I'll show you. I'm making notes in um, Notion. This is where I keep all of my um, information on what videos I'm going to do. So uh, 1040 estimator. I think you said it was at, at Dinky Town, right? Which is a thing. What else do we got? You're actually looking at, this is actually the YouTube. You're looking at me up here, but it's delayed. That'll give you a headache watching that, trust me. Um, well, there is your M product. I don't know what that is, Salty. What are you talking about? Fidelity Website Life Planner. Yeah, that's a good one. Did I get the... What did you call this again? Fidelity Website Life Planner. All right. I'll take it off this because it's probably giving you a headache watching all, all this back and forth. Robo Advisors, got it. I, you know, Paul, you mentioned Wealthfront. So I think, I think Betterment and Wealthfront, they're both great. If I were going to pick one, I'd probably pick Wealthfront. Um, 
you know, they, they have exposure to REITs, as I recall, and I don't think well, Betterment does, which you could make the argument either way. Um, but they're both great. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's really a crapshoot or to toss up. They're both, they're both really good. Um, alternatives to Google Sheets with Google Finance function. I, I, I'll put that in. I'll put that down. I don't know of any. And, and the issue is, I don't know of alternatives that, use, that, that give you the, the kind of tools that the Google Finance functions give you. Acorns and Stash, those are great. Um, I think, you know, so yeah, I'll do both of those. My son uses one of them. I forget which one now. One thing I'll say, so you know how I feel about fees, and I, th I think the fees on Acorns is 50 basis points or something like that, which would be more than I would pay, but, but here's the reality. A lot of folks that use those apps are just getting started, right? And they're trying to save everything they can, and the roundups help, and you know, which these uh, apps allow or, and whatnot. And I think they're fantastic. I think when you're very first starting out, you, you want to be aware of fees, but you know, when you're just starting out and putting 50 bucks a month in or 100 bucks or 25 or whatever, 50 basis points versus 25 basis points, I, got, I lose no sleep over that at all. Um, I, you know, I probably wouldn't hold a million bucks in acorns, but um, that's not most people's problem. It's getting started. That's most people's problem. Um, I think they're great. Man, you guys are giving some great, let's see here. Please explain backdoor Roth again. Okay, well, I, I'm gonna get back to the tools, but let me just, since that was the topic of the day, here's how backdoor Roth, here's the deal on backdoor Roth. And to understand it, a little background will help. If you wanna open up a Roth IRA and just contribute to it directly, that's great, but your income can disqualify. You can make too much. And that the income limits change from year to year. Um, and the income limits are different if you're a single taxpayer versus uh, married filing jointly. But the point is, you can make too much to contribute directly to a Roth IRA. Under current law, what you can do instead is contribute to a traditional IRA. So you'd literally open up account at Vanguard or Fidelity at M1 Finance. You'd stick money in uh, an I a regular old IRA. You'd then open up a Roth IRA. So you'd have two accounts and then you'd tell them, hey, this money I just put in the traditional IRA, move it over to the Roth. That, you've converted, that's a conversion, it's that simple, right? Now, when that happens, you have to pay taxes on any part of the conversion that hasn't been previously taxed, okay? So let's imagine uh, you have no IRAs, you open up a traditional, you put six grand in it, and you don't deduct it. So remember, with a 401k, it comes out of your paycheck, right? And so your employer deals with all of the deductions and it gets automatically subtracted from your income for tax purposes. That's a 401k or 403b or the TSP. There's no one monitoring your IRA contributions, right? So you have to deduct them yourself on your tax returns, right, at the end of the year. But some people aren't, they're disqualified from doing that. The rules are more complicated. It, it, it comes down to your income, your marital status, and whether you have, um, uh, the account owner of the IRA has a um, workplace retirement account or, or, or available to them, or, or if they're married, their spouse does. I and mean, the rules are kind of complicated. But, but the point is, some people can't deduct IRA contributions. All right, no worries. I'm going to put my six grand in, immediately move. I've already, I'm not going to deduct it. So this is after tax money. I've already paid taxes on it, so to speak, right? I, it was in my paycheck or whatever. And I'm going to move it over to Roth. Now, but why do they call it backdoor? Is that some IRS term? No, I don't know who coined that phrase, but it's, it's backdoor because it's a way to get money into a Roth IRA, kind of, you know, first in the traditional, then you sneak it in to the Roth, even though your income would prevent you from contributing directly to the Roth. And I know it sounds kind of scammy almost. I can't, I can't contribute directly. By the way, this hand is a Roth. I can't contribute directly, but I can go over here and contribute to this traditional IRA and then, then put it over. Yeah, that's how it works. Um, now, there is a big gotcha. Let's imagine you got, uh, what can I say, $10 million, <laughs> doesn't matter. Let's say you got 50,000 in a traditional IRA and you've taken deduction, so it's after tax, uh, I mean before tax, 50 grand, but you've gotten some raises, 
you know, now you don't qualify for the deduction, you don't qualify for the Roth, and you, 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 you hear some chucklehead on YouTube doing a live Q&A stream talking to some guy named Salty, and you think, oh, I'll just, okay, I, I don't wanna contribute that 50 over to the Roth because I'll, I'll have to pay taxes, right? So what I'll do is I'll open up a brand new traditional IRA and put 6,000 in it, and I'll just contribute that. I'll leave the 50 alone, but I'll just contribute the 6,000. I've already paid taxes on it, I can't deduct it now, I make too much money, and I'll put that in the Roth. Well, what the government says is, no, nah, no, nah, not so fast. Even though you never touch the $50,000 IRA, we're gonna treat that one and this new one you just opened and put six grand into as one giant IRA. And we're gonna take the ratio. You got 56,000 total. So 6,000 divided by 56, whatever that ratio is, we're gonna apply that to the 6,000. You don't owe any taxes on that. But the 50,000 divided by 56, we'll call it 90%, I don't know what it actually is. 90% uh, of that 6,000, we're gonna tax you on. So what that means is if you've got pre-tax IRAs, particularly if you've got any, any amount in them, it kind of eliminates uh, some of the benefit of backdoor Roths. Um, it, it's one of the reasons my wife and I have never done a backdoor Roth. I would if I could, but it would just, I would end up paying 99% <laughs> or whatever of the conversion in taxes and it just doesn't make sense. So there you go, that's my explanation of backdoor Roth. Hope that it was helpful. Um, Oh, M product, so Salty, do you mean M1 Finance? That's where I invest my credit card rewards. So yeah, I can do an M1 Finance review. All right, what else we got? Now I'm back to the tools, so if you... Demo, mor so Bob wants me to demo Morningstar free version. All right, well, hang on. Um, let me go to my YouTube channel. Um, actually, if you just go to, if you just go to YouTube, and you, you put in the search bar, Morningstar um, Guide. I don't know. Yeah, I'm like the first one up there. Yep, Morningstar. Yep, I've got the first and second and third. And maybe because I'm signed in. But all of my videos on Morningstar, you'll see there. I've done a lot of them. I am planning on doing another one. I don't know if this will be useful to people. You can tell me. But um, kind of just walking through just the simple. And I've done this in the past, but I think a refresher would be good. How to evaluate a mutual fund. The, the, the problem with Morningstar is that it gives you a ton of information. It's just, it's like drinking from a fire hose. And so one of the challenges is figuring out what's important. It's like reading a 10K. I was reading Microsoft's 10K this morning. I know, I need to get a life. I don't even own shares of Microsoft, at least not, not outside an index. Um, and the, 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 the challenge with the 10K is knowing what's important and what's not. So I'm, I think I'm gonna do another video on Morningstar, kind of just walking through specifically how I would use it to evaluate a mutual fund. Um, all right, let's see. Joe mentioned Fidelity Retirement Calculator. It's okay, we'd like to find better. So Joe, I got you covered. So I'm gonna do a more detailed review of Personal Capital's Retirement Calculator. Um, I'm gonna do one on new retirement, which I think is a great tool. It's very different than personal capital. Um, and I've had uh, um, the founder, um, Stephen Chen, on the channel, but I'm going to do a review of that. And when I say review, I mean like a demo. I'm going to show it to you, walk through it. The challenge with, with demoing new retirement is it's got so many, um, you can model everything. I mean, it, it covers every, I mean, it comes down to like, what kind of Medicare coverage do you want? I mean, it covers everything. Um, it's a lot, but um, once you understand it, it's an easy tool to use. There's definitely a learning curve though. Okay. Jerry says, love the tools you use on a regular basis starting uh, using Portfolio Visualizer. Yep, maybe I could do more on that. Honestly, Portfolio Visualizer offers a tool features that I haven't even begun to use myself. It's a very um, rich tool. Philip has a great question. Rob, have you found that when using personal capital, do they respect your decision to not use their services? In other words, are you bombarded with cold calls? So I am not. Um, once I've told them I'm not interested, they don't call me. Um, but it's a point. It's a good point. I mean, you know, it's a free tool. And that's, that's a good thing. 
but it's they're using it for marketing and that's fine I, mean, I have no problem with that but you know you could get a paid tool the problem is i mean there, there are paid tools like um well new retirement there's a free version and then a paid version they're obviously not going to bombard you with calls but they also don't do some things that personal capital does i mean new retirement i think is a great tool but like it doesn't give you a breakdown of your asset allocation for example um now there are other tools that do um uh, I'm trying to think what well, eMoney Advisor does, but you can only get that through an advisor. You can get part of eMoney Advisor through Fidelity, but not the full tool. Um, anyway, yeah, so Philip, they've respected my decision. I don't know. Um, but it is a complaint they get that, because they do, they want to talk to you. Um, so, yeah. All right, I'm just I'm going to focus on um, tools, but I will I'm skip so I'm skipping some questions, but I'll come back to them. So financial experts network. I'm guessing that was not your given name, but maybe it was. Uh, Maxify from yeah. Um, so I've got that on my list. I've never used the tool, but it's on my list. Uh, Bob demoing Morningstar. I mentioned the the videos I've got. I'm going to do more. Uh, let's see. So Vinyl, hey man, uh, welcome back. He says, would be interested in stock screeners. So I will do some, some reviews of those. It's a bit of a challenge to me because I don't use stock screeners. Um, the one that I've used is Stock Rover, and you can check that out. I think it's a good one. Um, so, uh, but I will do more because a lot of folks have asked for that. Net Worthify, yeah, that's a good one. Um, let me actually, uh, I'll, I'll, let me put it in my notes first. Net Worthify, um, but let me pull it up on the screen. So here it is. It's literally Net Worthify. You can see it right up here. dot com. It's a free tool. That, that basically tries to calculate when you can retire. And it's a very easy tool uh, to use, gives you a breakdown. Um, it, it keys it off of your savings rate. You can see in this hypothetical, this, this hypothetical person is saving 60% of a $50,000 annual income. If you can do that, I am amazed. Um, one thing I'll mention if you use this tool to play around with, see this link right here, show more options. This is important because it allows you to change the annual return on investment assumption and the withdrawal rate. As you know, those are critical assumptions. Quick explanation here. It starts with 5%, and I think the theory behind that is it's an after inflation return. Now, what the actual return is gonna be over any period of time, who knows? But obviously you can change that. And the withdrawal rate, the thing I'll say about that, I don't know how easily you can see that on the screen, but it's set to 4%. I think I still think 4% is perfectly reasonable if you're 65. If I were retiring at 55, I'd probably use three and a half. If I were retiring at 45, I'd probably use no more than three. Uh, but you got to, to see those, you got to hit this show more options link. So, but a great little tool. I've used it. I, I used it. I've used it a lot over the years. I mean, just usually when I'm writing something and I want some quick calculations. Um, all right. Uh, let's see. Tip ranks for stock screeners. Okay, that's one I don't know. So I'll make a note. Got it. Um, bear with me, just looking at some. I may have missed some. Yeah, Salty mentioned full view. That's the Fidelity tool, right? I think that's the Fidelity tool that's powered. Well, I will. Why do I need to ask? I got a computer and I'm. Not afraid to use it. Yeah. What, so if you look at this, yeah, I'll show you on the screen. This is Fidelity's full view. I don't believe you have to have an account to use it. And it's powered by eMoney Advisor. I don't know if it actually says that. Yeah, right down here. eMoney Advisor, LLC. I don't know if you can read that. But um, eMoney Advisor is the tool that I use, but you can only have access to it through an advisor. Um, I don't have an advisor manage my money, but I have I, I pay Mark Zorrell of Plan Vision, a very small monthly fee. And basically he and I talk once a year and I get access to eMoney Advisor. <laughs> That's the deal. Um, so anyway, yeah, 
that's a good tool. Um, so it's again, it's a sort of a watered down version of eMoney Advisor is what the Fidelity full view is. Um, all right, I'm sure I've missed some, but I'm gonna go back to the top of the chat and start answering questions. And I'm sure I'll come across the other tools. So let's see. Frank, good morning, and I'm happy to do these sessions. By the way, before I forget, next week there is no live Q&A. I can't, can't do it next week. Two weeks from now I'll be back, God willing. Um, Tyler from Cincinnati, Ohio. Love the Reds. Although, I, you know, I grew up in Ohio. Um, so I grew up during the big red machine. Pete Rose, Johnny Bench. Um, coaches hated Pete Rose because we all wanted to slide head first. Into first base, second, didn't matter where we were, where, where we were headed. Into first base, you know, you slide head first, that's what you do. You'd also, you'd, you'd crouch down when you were batting, you know, they hated that, and then you'd do this with your arm. Now, how many of you know what that's all about? All right, enough about the Reds. By the way, congrats to the Ducks. Where's my Ohio State Buckeye hat? I think it's, I think it's in another room. Anyway, yeah, tough loss. We got a young team. It'll be a rough year, though. So Vinyl says, if corporate tax goes up and interest rates go up in the same quarter, S&P will go down sharply. Yes, I agree with that. Although it's interesting, if tax rates go up by 5%, it doesn't mean their after-tax earnings will go down by 5% because not all earnings are taxed at U.S. corporate tax rates. But definitely going to impact after-tax earnings. There's no question about it. All right. We got someone from Columbus, Ohio, Sridhar. I'm sure I mispronounced that. I'm so sorry. Welcome. I'm still going to say go Buckeyes. Um, all right, where am I here? So James says, to generate more taxes, the Fed should get rid of traditional 401ks, money is immediately taxed and person's 401k is not taxed again, except for matching. Hmm. Well, that's a proposal. I don't think that's really, I don't think anyone's really thinking about that right now. Joanne, welcome from California. So Scott says, hey Rob, how do you feel about 5% of your portfolio dedicated to speculative funds or stocks? Cybersecurity, biotech, and 3D printing. Thanks. I, I think it's perfectly fine. I, um, it's kind of what I did um, when I just started investing in individual stocks. None of them are speculative, uh, but I'm obviously taking a risk that an individual company will underperform the market or who knows, blow up. Um, but it's, 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 a, it's a growing part of my portfolio because the stocks I've picked have just happened to do really well. That could change. Um, Apple is the big one in my port. I only have four stocks, so an Apple's, I don't know, 70% of it or something. But it's still a relatively small percentage of my portfolio, um, although it's growing. Uh, I think it's perfectly fine. I think, it, 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 here's the thing. I mentioned this in the international video about should you have international exposure. The big question is, can, when you take your portfolio as a whole, can you stick to it for the next 30 years? And for some people, in order to do that, they got to have some percentage of it where they can just kind of get crazy. Now, you know, your brand of crazy may be more crazy than my brand of crazy. That's okay. Um, you know, I don't think 5% personally is a, is a bad idea at all if that's what you want to do. All right. So I got an interesting question here from a name I just, I won't even try to pronounce. Um, they're, they're, not, they're, from, they're not from the United States and they say, I've been buying government bonds, which pay a coupon of 15%. Um, I want to start investing in the US stock market. How much of my portfolio should I invest in the US? Well, it's interesting. Studies show that there's a home-based bias. Doesn't matter where you live. Folks in Canada invest most in can Canadian companies, even though Canada represents a tiny, 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 tiny fraction of the market cap of the world. Um, I think 
most people should be heavily invested in the U.S. I, I can't give you a percentage. It's going to depend on all kinds of factors, your goals, your risk tolerance. But um, I, as you know from the international video, I do believe you should have expo direct exposure to international stocks. Many of you disagree. That's fine. Um, but I think where you live, other than currency issues, so there could be currency issues that affect where you invest. Although some funds hedge the currency risk, you'd have to look at the fund details. Um, but obviously, you're going to invest, at, say, in a U.S. index fund. They're not going to hedge uh, the way you would want. You might want the hedge. Uh, so anyway, uh, so when I talk about hedging, I mean from a U.S. perspective. But I think beyond that, there could be tax issues as well. Now that I think about it, but really, you should be indifferent. I think to where the he company's headquartered. Um, at, at least vis-a-vis -vis where you live. I mean, you know, why should where we live, other than, again, things like taxes and currency issues, affect what you invest in? I don't know. Be like if I only wanted to invest in companies headquartered in Virginia. I don't think there's a few. Um, anyway, but I can't really give you a percentage. I, there's just too many unknowns, and that's something you're going to have to figure out. All right. Deke gave us the contribution limits, 19.5. I was right. It was a guess, kind of. Yeah, 6,500 for the catch-up. Let's see. Uh, Freebird wants to know if it's because of Peter Thiel. Um, yeah, probably. I mean, I think that was a big motivating factor for a lot of this stuff. Double Dog Blitz wants to know what brand of bike do I ride? Um, I ride a specialized Roubaix comp. That's what it is. And I think there are a couple of versions of the comp, one of which has, I don't know what it's called, but it's the electronic um, gear shifts. And I don't have that version. I have the one below it. So... Mark says, if the limit takes effect in 10 years, then those with the problem would convert now before it takes effect, raising tax dollars. That's right. And if you want your bill to pass, you probably want that for these 10 years, right? If it, if it went effective now, it would lower revenues. And then, again, this is just a guess, but then they would have trouble passing the tests that the bill has to pass in the House. All right. So R.A. asks, are you going to address the trust proposed changes? Could be big. I I'm not because I haven't looked at them. But I'll make a note. And I'll look at them for two weeks from now. Tyler says, you got me hooked on Portfolio Visualizer. That was very helpful. Yeah, it's a great tool. Sridhar mentions Wealthfront Path. I don't know what that is. And I Google it, and I still don't know what it is. I'll have to look that one up. I don't know what that is. Um, all right, let's see what else we've got. Are Acorns and Stash considered robo-advisors? Yeah, I think so. I mean, they're more than that, but like, if you, I think so, maybe not, hang on. Um, I think they are. The, the issue, the way I would define a robo-advisor is someone, is a tool that takes your money, um, invests it in different asset classes for you uh, in, through ETF, index ETFs, and then, you know, rebalances it and sort of does all the, the legwork for you. I think that's how they work, although I've never personally had an account at either. So uh, take that with a grain of salt. All right. Paul says, the whole tax loss harvesting concept is interesting, but slightly deceiving since it lowers your cost basis um, and the assets you pick up, essentially just kicking taxes down the road. 
Well, I think what you mean by lowering your bases is if you had something that cost you a hundred grand and it fell to 50, you sold, you got a $50,000 loss and then you waited 30 days to avoid the wash sale rule and then you bought it again, let's assume it hadn't changed in price and now your basis is 50,000. Um, yeah, I mean, that's gonna, I mean, I don't know that I'd call that deceiving. You can, you can use those losses to offset gains, but I mean, eventually, I mean, eventually assuming your investments go up, you're eventually going to pay taxes, that's true. Um, and the goal is to pay them in the year in which the amount you pay is the, the lowest. Of course, the trick is figuring out when that's going to be. Um, all right. All right, I'm cut back up to all the tools you want me to look at. Joe says, my pension has a lump sum option. What is the, what is the calculations used for taking it versus the stipend, I assume the monthly payout? Well. Yeah, so I mean, there's a lot of different factors in that. And it's not just a, a matter of calculation, right? But the, 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 the trick is this, the value of the, the future payments of the pension is unknowable, right? I mean, you can, or you, you, can, you can calculate it, but you've got to make some big assumptions, like when you're going to die, for example, right? It's like trying to, trying to value Social Security, right? Well, you don't know when you're going to die, and you don't know what interest rates are going to do. I mean, is your pension adjusted for inflation, for example, or not? Um, and um, if you took a lump sum, uh, what would you do with it? And are you more comfortable investing it on your own or maybe with an advisor versus being able to just get the payments each month and let the insurance company, or whoever the pension is with, government, I guess, um, you know, deal with the investing and they're on the hook for making these payments and how secure is it. So there are a lot of factors, but you can, you can just Google, a you'll get calculators, but again, um, they're only as good as the assumptions you put in them. Um, and I think there are a lot of factors that go beyond just the calculation. You can even ask them how they calculate it. They're gonna assume a discount rate, which is just a percentage um, to turn the future, the stream of future payments uh, into a present value. I'm not sure that those always favor the individual, um, but you know that that's kind of a, a very quick how I think about that those issues. To me, the calculation is only one part of it, and may, maybe not even the most because they're going to calculate it in a way that's roughly correct. I mean, the the problem now though is interest rates are so low that the present value, the way they're going to calculate that, is that going to help you? No, it's not. It's like an annuity. Right now, annuities, $100,000 won't get you a monthly payment anywhere near what it would have 20 years ago. So, you know, that's how I would think through it. The calculation is probably not a great time to take the lump sum, would be, my, would be my guess. I don't know. You'd have to look at the numbers they give you. I guess what I'm saying is it's hard to answer that question in, in, in the abstract. There's just too many unknowns in terms of the calculations, the assumptions, what you're going to do with the money if you get a lump sum, how old you are, your life expectancy, do you have health issues, are you comfortable investing the money on your own? There's a lot of factors to consider. By the way, if someone like Mark Zorrell would help you with that. I'm not trying to push him. I have no financial relationship other than I pay him a monthly fee. He doesn't pay me anything. Um, but he could help you run through those numbers and give you the things to think about. Or you could use someone else. It might be worth it. It's an important decision. If you invest in, this is from Mark, if you invest in, in funds, how much of a particular stock do you own? For example, if fund A and fund B has Apple in the portfolio, how much Apple do you effectively own? Well, that's a great question. And I got the answer for you. I'll, or I'll show you how to, how to figure it out yourself. So I'm in Morningstar, um, and we'll just look up uh, an S&P 500, and we'll use Apple. So how much does this fund have in Apple? Well, we just go to Portfolio, and we scroll down, and 6.15% of this fund is in Apple. So if you have 100 grand, just over 6 grand is in Apple. 
and you can you can look at more holdings. This is the top ten, but you can look at more. And you could you could go to the fund website itself, and I think see all their holdings. Right? Um, they get pretty thin. I mean, even in this um, S and P five hundred index fund, when we get down to I don't know how many holdings are here 20 25 I mean we're already down to 0.64 right and we're, you know we're really still at the top but that's a quick easy way to see how much a fund holds it gets a little trickier um, I'll show you where it gets trickier now why did it do that I, there we go let's do a, um, a target date retirement from from Vanguard so we want to know we want to know what, what this fund owns. How much of Apple does this fund own? Well, you go to portfolio, we think we're doing good. We just, we just did this, right, with a different fund. How hard can it be? Um, and you come down here and you say, wait, what? what? These are not companies. <laughs> it's because this is a fund of funds. This fund owns other funds. These are the funds it owns. So to answer the question, how much Apple does this, comp does this fund own, we've now got to go in and actually look at total stock market index. Look at this fund, see how much Apple it owns, and then multiply that by 48.9% because that's the percentage that of this fund that's in this fund. I'm guessing, by the way, that these other funds don't own Apple. Well, actually, the bond funds could own Apple bonds, potentially. But I'm guessing Apple is not in the International Stock Index Fund. The point is, when you get to fund of funds, it can get a little, you know, a little more work involved. Paul, thank you for the kind words. I'm glad you enjoy the show. So, Mark. You then say, could indicate concentration of risk. Is there a tool that shows this? Yes, Morningstar, there's a different tool. Um, I'll show you. Let me pull up. They have a portfolio. You can, you can save your portfolio in Morningstar um, for free. You gotta sign up, but I don't think you have to have the premium account. And here, we'll use this. This is a portfolio I put in for Big Tony 11. Remember that? Remember Big Tony? This is one of the portfolios I evaluated, who knows when. And actually, as I think about it, I do think you need to be a premium member, not to, not to um, put your portfolio in, but to get the x-ray tool, which is what I wanted to show you. Um, and then it's been a while since I've done this. I think it's stock intersection, yeah. So if you put your portfolio in, all the funds that you own, and then you hit X-ray, let me make this a little bigger, and, um, and then you go to stock intersection, it will show you. So it'll not only show you what percentage of your, of your portfolio is in a given company here, 3.5% in Apple, but it then gives you the breakdown of the, you know, the funds that own Apple. And Microsoft, Amazon, and I think this gives you, let's just go all the way down to the bottom. I hope this scrolling is not giving you a headache. Big Tony owns 0.01% in his portfolio. That's Fidelity. How about Snowflake Inc. Ordinary Shares? Although that's 0%. FedEx, here we go. FedEx. So, yeah, I mean, you could really drill down. Um, the downside to Morningstar's portfolio tracker um, by the way, the percentages over here show you the percent, in this case of Apple, that's in this fund. But this shows you the percent that's in your portfolio because it's gonna be lower, right? Because this is not the only fund you own. If this was the only fund you owned, this would equal this. But it's not, you have other funds. The downside to, to Morningstar portfolio is um, you gotta enter everything by hand. In theory, you can import. I've tried, it's a disaster. They've talked now for years about being able to connect your accounts, but you can't do that. So Deke asks about Form 8606, which I think is the IRS form showing, um, is it showing conversions? Well, let's look it up. I know this form, I've dealt with it before. Or it could be non, 
non-deductible, that's what it is. So IRS Form 8606 is used to report non-deductible contributions you've made to a traditional IRA. And if you do make them, you do want to fill that form out. Because remember, if you convert and you've got non-deductible, well, first of all, you want to be able to establish you've got non-deductible, but it also establishes how much. So remember, you could have non-deductible IRA, but then it has earnings that you've not been taxed on. Right? So the idea with the backdoor Roth is you'd, you'd put the money in the traditional IRA and convert it right away. In fact, you might not even invest it. It might go into some cash fund at wherever. So it had, you, know, you convert it the next day or even the same day, so it has no, no earnings. But what if you've had it in there for a couple of years and then you convert it? It's got some earnings. And you want to be able to demonstrate how much of your IRAs are non-deductible contributions. So yes, Form 8606 is important. By the way, I'll show it to you. Just Google Form 8606, here it is. Um, and there it is, the IRS. Non-deductible contributions you make to traditional IRAs, among other things. And I remember, I, did, I knew nothing about that form until a number of years ago, because I was making a few non-deductible contributions to something, I don't remember what it was. And my accountant was like, well, did you fill out Form 8606? And I'm like, I don't know, you did my taxes. Did you fill out Form 8606? I don't use that guy anymore. Tyler says, Acorns has a $3 a month fee, which ain't bad. It's funny how we are with fees. I mean, you know, I'm all big on fees, particularly, you know, percentages of assets under management, but like a bank fee, and people go crazy over a few dollar fee, and then, but they spend th three, four bucks every day at Starbucks. Anyway, but they offer found money through sponsors. I've earned $175 in free money by purchasing things through them that I would have, have otherwise purchased. Good to know. Hmm. And Taylor says he's got about a thousand bucks in acorns and the fee's just $1 a month. Nice. I mean, that's, can't beat that. Let's see. Salty. He's really, I think he, I've really got him twisted on this credit card thing. I would like to know more details on how you can convert statement cash credits to M1 Finance and how you transfer that money. More than happy to help. In fact, I just did this the other day. Hang on, I'm gonna show you my M1 Finance account. This is actually the only account I show, and it's in fact the only brokerage that I acknowledge that I have. I don't disclose where my, all my money is held. And that's one of the great things. I love Vanguard, but I don't have to have my money at Vanguard to buy a Vanguard fund. Um, all right, so here, this is my portfolio. It's got $27,933.87. This comes all from credit card rewards and a small amount from Ebates, which is now called Rakuten because Whoever is the director of marketing at Rakuten isn't very good. I mean, Ebates was a great name. Anyway, um, and uh, so you can see activity here. And I put in $824.56. So, and th th that was actually, I, I normally do this on a monthly basis. That was not one month, that was more. Um, so, to answer your question, Salty, I log into my credit card accounts and um, I cash out the, the rewards. And in most cases now for me, it's cash. So I've got the Bank of America uh, premium rewards card. And that's, you know, I think they give you points technically, but you just log into the account and ask for cash. They put it in my bank account. I also have the Amazon card. I think for those, I actually just use it as a credit on the credit card. But remember, all of this is fungible. It's just money, right? I mean, I, you know, um, and, but I add that up, so I say, okay, I put X dollars from Bank of America credit card in my checking account, and that's whatever, 200 bucks. And I just cashed in my Amazon points and got 50 bucks. So I just used it as a statement credit. That's fine, but I add that, 50 bucks. And then the other card I use is for my business. It's Capital One Spark Cash. It's 2% cash back. And I usually just apply that as a credit as well to my business account because it's just easy. Um, but I add that up. And then I take the amount and I literally, in fact, I can show you here. Um, I literally go here and I say, okay, I want to deposit money. 
I select the account, which is my checking account. I put the amount in, which I've just added up for you, you know, just from all the different accounts that I've either cashed out or applied as a credit, whatever that number is. And I hit continue and I'm done. And it puts the money, deposits the money right into my portfolio. In the case, one of the things I love about M1 Finance, when it, when it puts the money in and invests it, I've got this set up so that I want it to be 50-50 between Wells Fargo and Bank of America. Well, you can see it's not 50-50. Right now, Wells Fargo's got a little bit more than Bank of America. That's just based on their performance. And so when, when I deposit money next, they'll put more of it in Bank of America automatic, automatically to get them up to 50-50. Now, you know, if I were doing this for like long-term investing for an IRA or something, first of all, I wouldn't be investing in bank stocks. I'd be in index funds. And I'd have whatever, it could be a three fund, a six fund. You know, we've talked about these things in the past. My allocation would be whatever it is. And um, when I made deposits, they would do the same thing. Um, I could click rebalance over here and it would automatically rebalance these. Um, in an IRA, that's what I would do based on my rebalancing schedule. This is a taxable account, one, two, they're not off by that much. I'll just let contributions do the rebalancing. That way I don't incur any taxes. So that's it. Now, if it were points or miles and I, and I could get the most value from them by using them for travel, I would. I would use them for travel. I'd take the, the Chase Sapphire Reserve, that's a card I have, points, book the travel through Chase Ultimate Rewards. Let's say it would, would have cost me $500, but I use points instead. I mean, again, it's all fungible. Just, I mean, you know, we call it points. You could call it widgets. It's, it's money. It's something of value that I can trade, right? You could call it Bitcoin. Well, probably not, but I would then just take the 500 out of my checking account. I mean, without the points, the 500 would have left my checking account to buy the airline ticket, right? But I've got points instead, so then I take the equivalent and put it in here. Now, in my case, the vast majority of what you see here doesn't come from points and miles. It's from cash back. Um, but there's some of it um, that did come from that. So that's how I do it, Salty. I hope that helps. So Born Again Bride asks, are your international investments 15 to 25% of your total investments or 15 to 25% of your equity investments? Vanguard recommends 40% total seems high. So um, they're 15 to 25% in my case of total investments. Now keep in mind, my allocation right now is roughly 80-20. Um, that includes individual stocks. Um, but yeah, I think, I think of it in, on, in, on a total basis. And yeah, 40% is rich for me. It's interesting, there are different perspectives. I, I like to listen to a number of different people. In fact, if you've, if you've um, subscribed to my newsletter, there'll be a link under the video. It goes out Sunday. This Sunday, the, link, the newsletter is gonna include a link to an interview of Howard Marks of Oak Tree. And he's a very sensible guy. I like to follow a lot of value investors, and he's a value investor meaning he's trying to buy good companies at fair prices or even below intrinsic value if he, if he can. I don't know that such a thing exists much right now. Um, and I, I listen to Ray Dalio. He, he, he invests in ways that I wouldn't probably. Of course, you know, he's a billionaire, so it shows you what I know. Um, and um, he's very big on international investment. Of course, he's big in China. Um, and a lot of people are just not interested in investing in China. I, I think, you know, I have... My international exposure, it includes emerging markets. Emerging markets, China is the big one. Um, and I'm very comfortable owning, owning that. I understand all of the risks, um, uh, but I mean, that's what you get. You get greater returns long-term just with more volatility. Um, but in any event, yeah, 40%, I, it seems high to me too. I, I wouldn't go that high. Particularly since the index funds in the U.S. are heavily weighted, even if it's a total stock market index, it's heavily weighted to the big companies, and the big companies do business all over the world, right? Microsoft, Apple, Google, Tesla. All right. Hmm. Slim Dog says, I have a special needs kid. And I'm trying to sock away Roth. If they kill the backdoor Roth IRA, it hurts his future. Yeah. I mean, keep in mind, it, it would only hit you if your income, you know, was at a certain level, at least as it's proposed. 
You know, we have a number of good friends that have special needs children, and it make it, it's a you know it, it changes everything from a financial planning perspective. And I don't have to tell you that. Um, but things like life insurance take on you know ninety nine percent of people don't need life insurance after a certain age. Um, when you have special needs children, you know you've got to plan for what's going to happen when you're gone, and that changes everything. Um, so, you know, I hope, you know, I'm trying to think through, I guess backdoor Roth, I mean, Roths are great for inheritance, right? Um, so yeah, I guess though, depending on what you make, yeah, it could, um, I'm sorry to say, but again, at least as it's proposed, it would only hit you and maybe you make more than that. So maybe it would, it would hit you. Um, and we'll see if it goes through. It's just a proposal, but. Bob says, never understood why they allowed backdoor Roths when they um, also had income limits in place of contributions to Roth. Yeah, I know. I don't either. It's one of the things I don't like about Washington. It's got nothing to do with my own view of the way things should be. There's just some gimmick. It's, it's gimmicky. It's, you know, it's shenanigans. It, not shenanigans in the sense of anything like unethical. But they do jump through a lot of hoops for these budgeting rules, and, and, it, and it leads to a lot of silly things. Uh, what are you going to do? All right. So that says, won't we be allowed to invest just 6K to traditional IRAs? Yeah, this won't affect investments in traditional IRAs unless you've already got 10 million. I'm going to guess you don't. Raise your hand if you got 10 million in your IRA. Uh, but yeah, it shouldn't affect traditional IRAs. Mary says, hey, Rob, late to the show. Been loving your channel. Thank you. Glad to have you. You know, YouTube tells me that like 97% of my viewers are men. I don't know what, what's up with that. All right. Stock Rover, this is Scott. Stock Rover and Trading View are good tools. Well, I mentioned Stock Rover before. Uh, I'm not familiar with the other one, so let me make a quick note. I'll check it out. Trading View. Slim Dog says you can put 6K in an IRA, but if you make too much money, you, might, you may not be able to deduct it. And that's right. It's not just income. You know, like for, you know, if you don't have any workplace retirement in, uh, plan, um, then you can deduct it. But if you do, or if you have a spouse and, and the spouse does, and, you know, your filing status, there's other factors. But Alan says, can you do a backdoor conversion from a SEP? So, um, I've got something for you. Hang on. You guys are going to love this. I actually linked to it in a video, but didn't actually discuss it in the video. Uh, here we go. Here it is. The rollover chart. And it comes from the IRS. And there's the SEP. And then can you roll it over? And there's all these caveats and blah, blah, blah. But there you go. That answers a lot of questions about rollovers. Um, I'm going to jump over to YouTube's chat and uh, drop it in. The, I'm going to drop, drop the URL into the chat. There you go. All right. Titan Invest. I've heard of it. I know Titan. Um, but I'll have to do some, I, I don't have an opinion on it, but I'll add it to the list. There, my recollection is there was something I didn't like about it. <laughs> how, do you, how do you like that? I don't really remember it. I don't think I liked it. Kind of like sauerkraut. No, I don't need to eat it to know I don't like it. Um, and it's probably had to do with fees, but I could be completely wrong. I'll check it out. I'll let you know. Okay. Vinyl mentions quantum. By the way, here's what Titan looks like. Um, let's see here. Quantum online. Never heard of it. It's a thing. 
I'll check it out. Here's what it looks like. It looks like 1997 called and they want their website back. Whoops. Whoops. There we go. So there it is. All right. Ah. Trap Cracker. Hey, Rob, what are the actual logistics of an IRA? Obviously, you get to lower your taxable income, right? So when you can deduct it. And then you pay taxes when you withdraw the money. Yep. But does it go straight from your check to your IRA? No. So that's the thing. You got to do a little extra work. With a, with a 401k, your employer decides who's going to be the administrator of it, like Fidelity or Transamerica or whatever. And then they take it right from your check, right? With an, with, a, with an IRA, you have to open it up somewhere. You have to decide. It could be Vanguard, Fidelity, Schwab, um, M1 Finance, Betterment, Wealthfront. And then you have to fund it. Usually you do it, you can connect your bank account and you just do an online transfer. That's what I do with M1 Finance. But you have to do that yourself. Yeah, it's more work. It's not a lot of work, but yeah, you got to do it all yourself. James says, personal capital keeps on calling me. Well, James, have you asked them to stop? But yeah, if you have, they shouldn't keep calling you. And, and yes, back to the question before, you would deduct it on your tax return. So you wouldn't get, well, you wouldn't get the tax benefit right away, although you, you, you could reflect it in your withholdings, potentially, if you wanted to try to get your tax liability at the end of the year right at zero. Kind of hard. I've always found that hard to, to, get, to get it that precise, and I'd prefer a small refund to owing money. But yeah, it, it shows up you know, when you do your taxes. Portfolio charts. Andy mentions that. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, I'll, uh, man, I got a lot of work to do. By the way, anyone from Austin? I'm going to be in Austin. Uh, whoops. Here we go. Salty says, I use full view and personal capital. PC is really feature rich with API integration. What do you mean by that? I, mean, I know what an API is. They connect to your accounts, but I wasn't sure if you meant something else. Salty says, market is screwed today. Um, I haven't even looked at it. Let's take a look-see. Oh, come on. Here we go. That ain't bad. It's only down 58 bips. Anyway. Let's see. So John asks, have you used the Vanguard Beacon app and is it a better interface than their website? I have used it. Um, and I've got it on my phone. I don't use it a lot. Got it yeah, right here. Um, it's fine. Yeah, I, I, so Vanguard's website is frankly not great. I'm not gonna try to log in because it's a pain. Um, it's a pain because I use two-factor authentication. I hope you guys do too. Um, their website's not great. If you uh, are a digital advisor client, you get a better website um, uh, experience, which I don't like. It's like, well, wait a minute. You know, um, why, why that? I mean, and I've moved money out of Vanguard. Um, I love the funds. Vanguard as a broker, mm, not great in my opinion. I mean, if you've just got like an IRA, it's simple, you know, but at one point I had a pension there. It was, the website was terrible. Um, a business account and dealing with that was not fun. So I, I moved on, but love their, their investment products. How about a budgeting tool that adds expenses over a year? Yeah, I mean, there's several. I, I'm a big fan of Tiller. Um, I'll put Tiller in here to do some more videos on Tiller. I like it a lot. All right. Can you set up your IRA contributions to come directly out of your check before taxes? I assume check means your paycheck, and the answer is no.
Salty says he's down 15 grand. Well, I mean, if the market's only down 50 basis points and you're down 15 grand, you're doing okay. I say, you know, pour yourself a cup of coffee and enjoy the day. Uh, Martin says, I've been doing backdoor Roths for a while now. Best thing ever for those over the income restrictions. I'm still slightly under the new bill restrictions, so I'll continue. Nice. Let's see. I know I'm late to this because I'm catching up on the chats, but it's funny to see you guys talk about the market. It's interesting, Martin, and I'm, 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 I don't know if it's his last name, but in any event, he made a comment to another person in the chat, but he said, I had Vanguard before. Beacon is nicer, but still missing so many things. Changed over to Fidelity, which is way better. I'm still in Vanguard funds, though. Exactly. Uh, you know, I, I don't want to be critical of Vanguard, but there's another aspect to it. Because um, you, you know, when you have a certain amount of money there, um, you get, you know, special treatment. And at one point, you know, I got the special treatment and it's just not that special. And I wanted them to do an evaluation of my portfolio. And a, a, a lot of what, you know, at that time, it's even different now, but at that time, a lot of it, even then wasn't at Vanguard. And they wouldn't factor in other assets. I'm like, well, how are you going to give me a picture of my you know, evaluate my portfolio if you don't consider things that I have at other brokerages or at 401, you know. And I just went round and round. Finally, I just gave up. Because, you know, in theory, you know, you get the CFP and they'll do a analysis of your portfolio. And I just never happened for me. All right. Bob says, my personal finance consult. So he got a phone call. I guess personal finance. Is this from personal capital? Anyway, they had a call. No hard sell. We left it at that. Should I become interested in their management services, which he's not? I'll reach out to them. Oh, okay, good. Philip says, I noticed that Morningstar has an 8% turnover ratio for the total stock. And they have... 4% turnover for S&P. Is this correct? Well, um, it sounds reasonable to me. I mean, those are very low turnover rates. Um, the question, I guess, would be, yeah, and total stock market's turnover ratio is higher. Of course, it's got a lot more positions. I mean, it sounds about right. It's a very low turnover. If they're only basically selling 8 or 4% of their portfolio in a given year, I don't, I don't know why... It, it would it'd be wrong. Let's see. Ah, Mike, retired, mentions Max Rewards app, which I, I have not used but know of. Let me show it to you. If I can find it. Here it is. So it tracks credit cards. So, um, I'll check it out. Most of those work on an advertising model, which is perfectly fine. I mean, I, you know, have no problems with that, where, you know, they'll, they'll present you with credit cards that you might want to apply for and they'll get a fee. I, I have a credit card site. I don't do much with it, but in any event, um, I'll check out that app. I'm going to be the, the crash test dummy of a apps for you guys. I'm going to sign up for all of them. Huh. Vinyl is 100% individual stocks. Fascinating. I analyze each company before buying. 10K conference calls, business model. Yeah, you got to do a lot of work. You, you learn a lot on the business of the conference calls. One of the things I like to hear is how CEOs deal with a bad quarter. The best thing you can hear from a CEO, in my opinion, at least occasionally, is, boy, I screwed up. Yeah, I, made a, I made a bad decision here. Um which you don't often hear from a lot of them. All right. Let's see. Joe Lee, I guess, if I'm pronouncing it right, I have 70% in the U.S., 20% international, 5% in REITs, 5% in emerging markets. There you go. Looks good to me. 
I guess there's no bonds. Hopefully you're young. Robert says, what should be a 529 savings goal without worrying about over-contributing? I mean, I, I don't know how to answer that. First of all, it's going to depend on, of course, how many kids you have, how old they are, but also um, where they're going to go to school. Of course, you also have the problem of if they're going to go to school. I always found that troubling. I, I, I significantly under-contributed for that reason. I mean, you, you hope, I hope my kids will go to college, but, you know, when they're three, I mean, how do you know? So if someone's got a better answer than that, uh, love to hear it, but it's tricky. Fly a bus says, hey, Rob, I used to live in Northern Virginia as well in Nashville now. Love Nashville. Just wanted to thank you for all the content you put out. You're welcome. Thanks for joining. Mike says, go socks. Are you referencing the picture behind my shoulder? If you are, it's not the Red Sox. Although I loved when they won the World Series. Josh C29 says, I have the same Roubaix. Great bike. And I had a custom fitting with a computer. Um, and I'm going to get a new handlebar. I need, I need higher uh, on the handlebars uh, because as I age and I have knee and back and hip issues, you know, I'm, a 40-mile ride take, takes it out of you. June says 60% U.S., 30% international, 10% real assets. I'm curious what that is, like real estate or something else. James, on how they learned about the $5 billion Roth, um, Politico, or, or was it Politico? No, not Politico. Um, I forget the website, but they, they found out through a source they're not revealing. I, I think the story is they don't know the source themselves. So I don't know if it was someone in the IRS leaked it. There was a hack. I don't know. Or maybe at a brokerage firm. I, I don't think we know the source. Alan says, can I do a backdoor conversion of a beneficiary IRA? I'm not sure what that is. You don't like an inherited IRA? I'm not sure what a beneficiary IRA is. Maybe I should know. Is it a thing? Well, when I Google beneficiary IRA, I get inherited IRA. Um... I don't know if you can convert from an inherited. Obviously, you'd pay taxes. Um, I don't know if you can convert that or not. I looked at the a rollover chart that I showed you guys a few minutes ago, and it doesn't say. One of the problems with all of this is you think you, you might think, well, why not? I mean, it's kind of the same, right? You, know, you can't apply common sense to any of this. Let's see. So Brandon says, when rolling over a traditional IRA to a Roth, are taxes taken out of the value in that traditional before it rolls over, or do you pay taxes when you do, when you do your taxes? I'm pretty sure it's the latter, right? They, and, and in fact, one of the strategies is not to pay the taxes out of the conversion funds, right? Pay them out of, you know, money you have in your checking account. But you want to talk to your tax person because depending on when you do it, there could be, you know, might want to be paying estimated taxes to avoid penalties and other things like that. Let's see. Deke says housing prices will never return to 2019 values in the D.C. metro area. I don't know. I guess we'll find out. Ethan asks, is it riskier to put money into a smaller 
and in paren 200 million S&P index fund, five basis points expense ratio. I think if I understand the question you're asking, is it riskier to invest in an S&P 500 that doesn't have as much assets under management? Because like a Vanguard or Fidelity is going to have billions or whatever. I don't know why it would be. It's certainly not riskier from a investment perspective. It's the exact same thing, right? Assuming they're tracking the same index in the same way. So I don't know why it would be riskier. I mean, I guess I'd want to invest in a, a reputable company that's running the index, but I don't think, other than that, I don't think it'd be riskier. Martin wants to know, what's more important, the Morningstar rating stars or the silver gold rating? I'll be honest, I ignore both of them. It's the truth. Let's see. Baker asks, do you consider stable value funds within a 401k an acceptable substitute for bond funds? Um, it's helpful to have a specific example um, of a fund. I've never owned one. There's still going to be fixed income though, right? Yeah, I'm not sure how much they would be different than the bond fund. If they're yielding, I will say this, you know, because every fund is going to be different. So you need to look at the specific funds. If they're yielding more, and, and Baker mentions that one fund, if you want to drop the ticker in the, in the chat, that'd be great, but is yielding about 1.7%. So 1.7% is certainly more than 10 year, right? 10 year treasuries at what, 1, 2? Ten-year treasury is at, I don't know, one three. It opened at one three. So that's not significantly above the ten-year treasury. The question you always have to look at is, is how, if it's outperforming, how is it doing it? And it's either going to do it by taking on more interest rate risk, meaning longer duration fixed income of some kind, or more credit risk, moving away from treasuries into corporates, high-yield high corporates, merging market debt. There's a trade-off, right? There's no free lunch. And so then the question is really, are you okay with that trade-off? But 1.7 is not, you know, hugely different. Um, so, you know, that seems fairly stable, but yeah, I'd have to see the specific fund. Oops. Let's see. Kyle and Emily, what is the best account to have for a side job business? Brings in ten to fifteen thousand a year and looking to save around five thousand a year of this income. No employees. SEP IRA, simple IRA, solo four hundred one k. All right. Um, so the first thing is, I will do a video on the three. But my hunch is. Well, I will tell you this, the SEP IRA is just the, probably the, well, I don't know, I've not dealt with a simple IRA. The SEP IRA is extremely easy to set up. Um, you can set them up just about anywhere. And that's what I had for a while. I ended up moving from that to something much, much more complicated, which is a defined benefit plan for my business. Um, but SEP IRAs are extremely easy. Now, I don't think you can do a Roth, though. So if you wanted a Roth, you could do a solo 401k Roth. Um, I know that. I don't know about a simple IRA, if that could do a Roth or not. So I'll have to look into that for you. More on the credit cards and noting that some credit cards do not convert points or miles to cash. Is that true? I'm not sure that's actually true. Uh, maybe you can't convert on some, but everyone I've ever looked at, you can convert if nothing else to a statement credit. But if I've got points or miles that are, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use them in the most valuable way. So like with Chase Sapphire Preferred I, or Reserve, I would use it for travel. If I can't 
use them for travel because I don't travel, I, w I, wouldn't, I wouldn't use the car. Clarissa asks, are composite index funds good? And then follow up, what does composite mean? And the answer is, I don't know, because I've not heard of that term in the context of an index fund. My hunch is it doesn't really mean anything, meaning I could be wrong though. As I tell my wife, it happened once before. This is what I do all day. I sit at my computer trying to answer questions. Yeah, I think a composite index is just a fancy word for index. That's my hunch. If someone in the chat says I'm wrong, I can live with that. Uh, L. Woodio says, how can we trust your financial wisdom now that we know you don't like sauerkraut? I don't know. I would think that would elevate me in the eyes of most people. I mean, I can't even stand the smell of it. I mean, who would take good corned beef on rye with a little mustard, which is all you need, and put sauerkraut on it? That's a sin. That should, that should be illegal. That should go in the tax proposal. No sauerkraut and corned beef can be mixed together, ever. By the way, if you're ever in Ocean City, Maryland, there is a deli there that is every bit as good as the best New York delis. And I, you know, when I'm in New York, I pretty much go to Cats now. There's Second Avenue Deli, right? Second Avenue? It's excellent. What was the one that closed? Broke my heart. And I always forget the name of it. I went there for years. There's Stage Deli, which I think is terrible. And then like two blocks away, I can never remember the name of that deli. And they closed after like 100 years. Anyway, <laughs> see what kind of great information you get on this channel? Hmm. Megan says, Rob, love your videos. Can you help me decide between VGT with a, uh, I guess it's 10 basis points fee and an, an FSPTX with a 69 basis fee? I have run portfolio visualizer, but I don't have the paid version to see how much the fees are eating into the return. No, actually you do. It's, um, it's a great question. So here's the deal. Let me pull it up. I'm gonna log in, show you on my screen. So here we are. So we're gonna back test a portfolio. You can see down here this fee structure, like I can add a fee structure. You don't, you don't need that to see how the expense ratio of a fund will affect the returns. Why? Because Portfolio Visualizer already accounts for the expense ratios of the funds, right? Because the, the returns that a, 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 that a, a VGT or VSPTX reports are after the fees. This fee structure would be, for example, if you hired a financial advisor and he or she, on top of expense ratios, had their own fee, right? So we can put in VGT, which is a technology fund, Vanguard, and Fidelities, which I'm not familiar with, but that's okay. I'm sure it's terrific. There we go, for, you know, for a technology fund, you can analyze them. Now, we have to look at the dates, and someone actually pointed this out because sometimes I forget to look at the dates. And it goes back to 05, which is pretty good. Um, it's limited because that's the data they have for Vanguard. All right. And they're pretty close, right? Fidelities is one, um, you know, well, by 50 basis points. No, more than that. 
70 basis points roughly. It's a little riskier in terms of volatility. Worst year is down a lot, a fair amount more. Um, max drawdown, another nine, nine points. Um, so there you go. But that, this, these returns account for the expense ratios. You would only need to worry about fee structures here if you paid a financial advisor and they were charging you whatever, 50 or 100 basis points or whatever it was. Hope that helps. Oh, I love this story. Tyler, he's 37 year old. He's an HVAC tech for 16 years, married, two kids, owns eight single family investment properties, five are paid off, putting wife through nursing school, hoping for financial flexibility for a career change for me. And it sounds like you're doing great. I own real estate investments for what I don't own any more at the moment. Great. I think they're great for diversity. I, I kind of wish I owned some. It's just that I don't have the gumption to actually go out and do what one needs to do to own real estate. It's a lot of work. I own five properties with a friend. Um, they were all HUD foreclosures. And we, you know, we rehabbed them. Um, did really well. Restoration says, what do you think of index funds? I like them. Oops, let's see here. Do I think QQQ is overvalued? So here's the trick. Let's look it up in, port in Morningstar. Here's the problem, the, 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 the difficulty with that question. Here's Morningstar, let's put in QQQ. We can all do this. We can go to, go to the fund, we can go to the portfolio. Let me actually make it a tad smaller. Oh, that was Big Tony, that's not what I wanted. Let me try this again. Go to QQQ, pull it up. I wanna to go to this portfolio down here and we can look at the PE. And it's 29, all right? We can look at the price to book, the price to sales. We all know that 29 is high. Uh, on, historic, on a historic basis. Given interest rates are so low, interest rates affect the value of an asset because the value of an asset is the present value of its future income streams. Think dividends and um, cash flows. Uh, and when interest rates are, are this low, you tend to use a much lower discount rate. You can think of the discount rate as uh, what's the, 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 the risk-free alternative to any investment. Well, it's whatever, 10-year treasuries, or if you prefer, 30-year treasuries. So they're all under 2%. And so when you use a number that's that low to calculate the, the current present value of future streams of income, you're gonna get a big whopping number. And so using current rates, I would say it's probably reasonably priced. But that all gets us to the point where we say, well, wait a minute, Rob, what will happen when interest rates could go up? Yeah, well, then it's no longer reasonably priced. <laughs> and it will come down. Well, then we wanna know, okay, when will that happen? I have no idea. I believe it'll happen, just don't know when. Eh, so that's my take generally, you know. It's probably somewhere in the reasonable range given, given historically low interest rates. Yeah, actually, I'm pretty sure Morningstar uses forward-looking PEs so like if we, if, we, if we Googled QQQ and we go to Invesco, which I'm not gonna click their ad, but eh, here we go. They might report, let's go to their fact sheet if we can find it. Eh, maybe product details will do it. Um, they might report a very different PE ratio. Let's see if it's in portfolio maybe. Let me see if it's, I'm missing it maybe. No. Closing price. Oh, here we go. Yeah. So here it's 33. Uh, uh, that could be based on trailing 12 months. Oh, yeah, it is. Because yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know if you guys can't even see this. Let me make it bigger. It's kind of bigger. So on the QQQ site, they show the price to earnings. And this is, yeah. And then they show forward price to earnings. 
and it's lower because the estimates of earnings for these companies over the next 12 years, or 12 years, 12 months are higher than the past 12 months. So, but in any event, still, you know, in the current, the current interest rate environment, you could justify about almost anything. And that's not literally true, but the problem is, the, the real question is, are, these, are things reasonably priced when interest rates go back up? And the answer is no. But that's true of a lot of things, not just the QQQ, right? What do you think about QQQM? I don't know. I don't know what QQQM is. Is it the same thing? No, it's not. Huh. Well, it comes up the same thing. I don't know what the difference is. Looks like the same thing. I don't know if it's a different share class or what that is. Okay. Question, do you think home prices will decrease? I think they'll fluctuate. I think if, if we have a sudden increase in interest rates, yes, they will decrease. So now it's TQQQ. I mean, you guys know, you, I don't know what any of this stuff is. Oh, it's pro shares. So they're just leveraging it, right? It's just going to be, it's going to be a multiple. Let's see here. I'm going to go to pro shares website. The 2X. Ah, here we go. So pro shares, they're big into funds that will 2X or 3X an index. So you can see here it's a leveraged. See this here, it's leveraged, meaning they borrow. Whoops. There. And it seeks to return 3x of the return of its underlying benchmark for a single day. Um, I'm just, I, I just, I don't know. I just don't feel need for that kind of investing. Obviously, if it goes down, you lose 3x, right? Felix, hey Rob, joining late today. Thoughts on having VTI, VGT, and VUG in one portfolio? Well, I mean, I guess one question is why, isn't there a lot of overlap between VGT and VUG? Let's see here. Gotta be, right? Gotta be, let's see here. We're gonna look at them side by side. Just give me a second to get, the, get this sort of set up on the computer. I could be wrong. Maybe there's not a lot of overlap. Here we go. So I got VGT. Of course, VTI is total stock market, right? There's, but there's no question there's a, over, a lot of overlap at the, at the bigger companies. We'll go to portfolio and portfolio. So they're both, yeah, they're both large cap growth. We knew that. That's not a surprise. Um, Price to earnings are similar. No, this one's 33. No, VUG is, is more richly priced. Um, I want to look at their top companies. Yeah, so they're different, no question, but still a lot of overlap. And then you add VTI on that, which is going to hold, what, 5% of Apple? Um, so, you know, I... It's probably not an approach I would take. Um, if I wanted to, if I wanted some exposure to tech or growth, you know, I might do that. I might do five or ten percent. That's not an approach I've ever taken. I'm more of a value investor. But I think the combination. I'm not sure that you would you would need it. You know, you could you could, you could probably do it in just one fund if you want the growth, or you know, in addition to you know, whatever other investment you have. VTI is a total stock market index fund. It's just notably, notably different than these two funds. I mean, there's some overlap at the top, right? Because the number, the top stocks will be the same, but it's risk profile and it's investing profile. It's, it's going to be a blend fund for starters. It's not going to be growth, right? 
Frank says, thank you for all you do, Rob, but Jack Bogle have changed his mind about international stocks at these high valuations. I don't think so, actually. Um, because in an interview he did, he, you know, he, that question was put to him. It's in 2018. And um, I think his answer was, you know, yeah, the valuations could be richer in the U.S., but there's sometimes, there's good reasons why sometimes an investment's valuation is lower. And I think he just viewed the environment in the U.S. as much better for investors than many environments throughout the world. So I don't know that he would have changed his... I don't know that he would have changed his um, his views. So I got another tool, Marcus Insights Budget Tool. Hmm. Marcus, of, of course, is the bank arm of Goldman Sachs, and um, I'll have to add this to the list. Got it. All right. James says, when the analysts don't say, great quarter guys on the call, those are the ones you should listen to. Yeah. <laughs> Vinyl says, a friend's son decided to go to community college for auto mechanics, but his friend had saved a quarter million dollars in his 529 form. Oh, uh, yeah, that sounds like they're doing fine, though. Ethan says, my 10-year-old daughter wants to be a YouTube star. Seriously, mom won't let her at this time. I don't know. It could be the way she makes the most money. Oops. Let's see. I'm almost catching up with real-time chat. Not quite. I'm trying. What time is it? It's almost 1 o'clock. Sam says, let's do emerging markets soon. What do you want to do? Evaluate it? I have the Vanguard Emerging Market Fund. I think it's great. Constantine says, does it make sense to start a 401k contribution with only one fund? And the fund example is VIGAX. Probably then rebalance into something to less volatility in 10 years. Monthly contribution will be 1k. Well, the short answer is, if you're just starting off, I have no, I don't see any issues with one fund. Now, which fund it is matters. It could be a, 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 um, a, a you know, a, a target date retirement fund. It could be a total stock market fund. You know, it's relatively small amounts of money. Um, this fund is the Vanguard Growth Index Fund Admiral Shares. I would personally... Obviously, you'll have to decide what you, what's best for you. I would not put all of my money in a fund that's not a broad-based index fund. This focuses on growth. Um, and uh, I personally wouldn't go that route as a single fund, particularly now. Um, I'll show you the fund in Morningstar. Obviously, it's growth. We've got the big blue dot over here, large cap. Um, the problem is, so things that do well for long periods of time often are followed by periods where they don't do so well. So for a long time, value crushed growth. Over the last decade or so, growth has crushed value. If I were betting, I would bet that value will outperform growth over the next decade. Now, I could be wrong, of course. Um, but... I do know this, growth won't continue to beat up on value forever. It's just not how it works. It's kind of like, you take an extreme example, Kathy Wood's fund that returned, whatever, 155% last year. That's probably as good an indicator as any that she won't do as well the next year or the year after. You just can't, you can't do that well for long periods of time. And in fact, any investment that does that well in the short term is the kind of investment that won't do that well over the long, it's just not possible. Um, now, obviously, growth versus value is not that extreme, but I would be hesitant to make a bet with all of my retirement money on a particular style of investing, particularly one that's done really well over the last decade, because I'm thinking it ain't going to continue to do that. I don't know when, when it'll switch. I don't know when the rotation into value will occur. Some thought it was going to occur earlier this year, and it didn't happen, because rates went up to like 1.7 or something like that for the 10-year, then they've come back down. But when rates go up, growth is going to get hurt. 
So I personally would not put all my money. I just pick, if, if I wanted to pick a fund, it'd be like a total stock market fund is what I would pick. Bob says only a spouse can do a Roth conversion on an inherited IRA. That makes sense to me because a spouse can take the inherited IRA and just basically treat it like their own. I have an inherited IRA from my, my, my stepmother. Obviously, not wasn't her spouse. Um, I've never looked into whether I could convert it to a Roth, but it kind of makes sense because there are unique rules that apply to inherited IRA. But if you're the spouse, you can treat it as your own. Which, by the way, is a good reason, you know, there, you may have other reasons to do something different, but from a trust and estates perspective, to have your spouse as the designated beneficiary of uh, the IRA or 401k, but IRA, um, as opposed to even if you have trusts involved for estate planning, you might have the trust as sort of the backup, but um, the spouse as the first beneficiary so that they get they can use the advantages that come with being a spouse who inherits an IRA. Obviously, you want to talk to your trust and estates lawyer. I am neither of those things, but that's my understanding. So Scott says, in most cases, the international markets follow the U.S. market when corrections and rallies take place. Where is the hedge other than the P.E. ratio as well? Yeah, there's a whole issue about how, how much diversity international stocks really give you. The problem is, or the challenge is, you have to look at a certain period of time. So when people look at up, you know, like the COVID crash, they look at a month, and they were highly correlated, that's fine. But you got to look over longer periods of time. And um, I'm just not convinced as well that, you know, the, the lack of diversity will always, always be the case. Time will tell. But, um, I mean, there's certainly studies out there that say the diversity you get is not as great as it once was. It's better for emerging markets than developed. Ah, Baker says, stable value funds are guaranteed payouts from insurance companies for a period of time. Most companies have them within their 401ks, and each is custom. I mean, I've never had one, but there are no tickers. Ah, there you go. Well... Then it's hard to say. I guess it's as good as the insurance company backing them. Um, but I don't have any experience with them. Let's see. Mike asked about NUSI. Huh. Here it is, Nationwide Risk Managed Income ETF. So it's got a 12-month yield of 7.45%. What does that tell us? It's doing something. How is it generating that income? Let me... Uh, let me look up the website itself. It's coming up. Ah, so it's cover it's a covered call. So a lot of folks, you know, I've, there's been a lot of folks email me about covered calls, call, covered call ETFs as an alternative to bond funds. Um, they certainly generate a lot of income, right? Um, and they probably would do extremely well in a down market, right? Because, you know, your calls are going to go up in value and you're not going to get them called away. I mean, they don't, you can avoid getting called. But if the market's going up, it'll cost you a lot of money. You'll lose money on the trade. Um, you know, what I'd have to look at is a capital appreciation. You know, I mean, it's it, you, you, you can't just look at the yield. you got to look at the overall total return as well. I don't want to get a great yield only to sacrifice total return. 
Now, if you compare it to a bond, I mean, bonds are yielding so little, um, I'd have to do the, do the, do the comparison, um, which I've not done. But I will do, I'll do a video on covered call ETFs. Little Joe agrees with my sauerkraut opinion. I mean, how can you not agree? I mean, really. But thank you. <laughs> now, yeah. No, Salty. It doesn't matter whether the sauerkraut comes from a frickin' jar or not. It doesn't matter how it comes. Awful. Nicola, welcome. From Bulgaria. All right, so Jay Baker mentions balanced funds and my review of Wellington. I, I do have that in my notes to do. Let me just make sure I can find it. So let me, uh, oops, I'm just going to add a note. I will do that. Ethan says, thoughts on buying an S&P index fund controlled by someone that votes your shares to better the environment? Huh, I don't know. Here's what I don't understand about the whole index fund thing is that how hard can it be to allow the beneficiary, sort of the beneficial owners to vote the shares? Maybe that's just impractical. I don't know, maybe there's technological issues. And by that, I mean you and me, right? Um, So Joel wants to know a comparison of VTI, VUG, QQQ, QQM, and VGT. Well, so, and, and they're gonna pick two of them for long-term investing. Well, so they're like, so v, there's VTI on the one hand and then all the others on the other. VTI is just a total stock market, right? So if I, if I had to pick two from, that, from that, those five, I would pick VTI. Um, of course, what percentage you put in each matters a lot. I would just pick VTI. <laughs> I would just go with one. I don't know between the other four which one I would pick. Um, they kind of do similar things. But, you, you know, it's going to be a hard choice. I mean, they kind of covered, there's a, there's a lot of overlap, right? We looked at VUG versus VGT and QQQ. Uh, what's QQ? I just still don't know what QQQM is. because it's based on the NASDAQ 100 index. Right? And so is QQQ, so I don't know what the difference is. Um, I can look that up later. But they're all gonna be high growth, high in tech, investments. Dan says a proper Reuben has sauerkraut on it. For those that do not like sauerkraut, you can substitute, but it's hard to imagine what that would be. No, it's not. The substitute would be nothing. I mean, it's like, why start with perfection? If you start with perfection, you don't need to add anything to it. Right? Kind of like my hair. I mean, how, how does it get any better? Smile and enjoy life. How do you like VFIIX as a cash holder? I have no idea. Uh, it's a GN, uh, yeah. Uh, so, I'll show you on my screen. It's a mortgage-backed securities. It's a government mortgage-backed securities fund. Um, I mean, the volatility is probably pretty low. Let me go to Morningstar. We can just look at... Um, might have been able to find it on the Vanguard site, but I can do it faster on Morningstar. 
I think. Its effective duration is just a little over two, so it's not going to be a particularly um, volatile um, fund. Its yield, though, uh, is probably pretty low. Yeah, 1%. I mean, it's probably fine. I'm trying to think if, you know, the mortgage industry collapsed, which would never happen, right? Uh, I guess the question would be why that versus something else? By something else, I'm thinking more of like short-term or intermediate-term treasuries. But it looks fairly, you know, it, fairly stable. Okay, thoughts on 100% or $100,000 equity from investment property to lump sum invested indexes. 30 year loan at 3.6%. Yeah, my rule is I don't borrow to invest. Which would be a better investing index, S&P 500 or total stock? I've already done a video on this. And, the, the, and you, which you can look in the channel. It's basically, they're basically the same, more or less. By same, I mean risk, returns, pretty neck and neck. Akeem says, when it comes to purchasing more um, exchange-traded funds like VTI, should you be buying at a specific price or just at the market purchase at the day? Well, I don't know. I don't know how you do it any differently. I, I'm not sure what you, if your question is, should you wait for a, a particular price? You may be waiting a long time. Depends on the price you're waiting for. I think for most people, you're just, you know, dollar cost averaging each month or whatever. And I think that's a great way to go. Deke, what is your thought on reinvesting dividends and capital gains in a, in a taxable account? Well, if you don't need the money, so first of all, in a taxable account, I don't automatically reinvest dividends. It goes to cash first. Um, if you don't need the money, then that's what I would do. I'd reinvest it, absolutely. If, if, you're, if you're old like me and you want to start spending some of it, that's, where I would tap, that's what I would tap first, since you, I'm, it's already, already, already going to be included in taxable income. That's what I would, what I would do first. Double Dog says, thanks for the info on Tiller. Yeah, it's a great tool. Brian says, Rob, love your videos. Thanks for the value. Thank you, Brian. Appreciate it. So Michael says, Rob, for someone who thinks they will want to and be able to retire in their mid-40s, is it still advisable to invest in a Roth IRA? Um, I think so. I mean, you know, the question you've got is, if you retire that young, what will you live on, right? And so that's obviously a question only you can answer. You may have taxable investments. Um, I just did a video on how to take money out of traditional IRAs and 401ks early. Um, so you can check that out. Obviously, with a Roth, you can always take out your contributions penalty and tax-free. Um, you, know, you know, beyond that, you're basically waiting until you're 59 and a half, barring some other exceptions and whatnot. So, you know, if, if, if you're going to, you know, there's Roth conversions, which are different than Roth contributions. You can convert traditional IRAs, and I talked about that in the video, Roth uh, IRA conversion ladder, which, you know, you got to wait five years after each conversion, but then you can spend the money. Um, but, you know, earnings on contributions and, and earnings on conversions are different. So it all gets tricky. You got to understand all the rules, but yeah, I don't think just because I'll put it this way, just because you're going to retire in your 40s doesn't automatically rule out a Roth, in my opinion. It might or might make other options more advisable, I suppose. But a Roth is a beautiful thing.
Lee says, thank you, Rob. I started my backdoor uh, IRA last year and ended up purchasing FXAIX, which I've owned in the past. I don't think I still own, but anyways, Fidelity 500 index fund. Ah, here we go, vinyl, thank you. QQQM excludes financial companies. That's kind of funny. It's like, we're gonna invest, but anything that's got maybe a reasonable valuation, we're gonna get rid of that. Okay. Uh, that seems to make sense for the QQQ crowd. If it ain't got a 30 on the PE, I don't want it. Toss it. What, it's a 12? Forget about it. I don't understand you guys. Fast, Fast Eddie says coleslaw would be a substitute. I, I just don't understand the need for a substitute. If the corned beef is good, you just don't need anything else. So passing through says, currently 401k is in VG, uh, Vanguard, target 2030. Okay, good. Have a Roth 401k option, but no Roth assets. Do not qualify for Roth, I assume a Roth IRA. Do I put the Roth, and I'm assuming Roth 401k, into the target 2030 or use other funds available? And there's some examples. I mean, I think a target, well, I think a target date retirement fund is perfectly fine in a Roth. If I were being sort of precise about it, the one question, I'm going to look up BTHRX. I'll show, show it to you on the screen. And I want to go to the portfolio. And you can see it's got 33% in fixed income. So, when it comes to a Roth, I think about what my mom likes to say. Sometimes, and mom, if you're watching, apologies, but sometimes she'll say, I'm f referring, well, I won't say who she's referring to, but she'll go, I'm fat as a tick. So I want my Roth to become as fat as a tick. Um, and, and to do that, I want to put in it those assets that have the highest expected return. So in theory, what I'd prefer to do is have stocks in my Roth accounts, and then to the and I could have stocks in my traditional accounts too. That's fine, good, right? But to the extent I'm going to have some bond exposure, fixed income exposure, I'd prefer to have that in traditional accounts rather than Roth. Because again, I want my Roth to become as fat as a tick. Well, you can't you can't divide it that way if everything's in a target date retirement fund, right? Now, having said all of that, a target date retirement fund is a heck of a lot easier. <laughs> you just throw it in and you're done. So if that's what you did, I would not. In my view, that would not be the end of the world. But if I were willing to do the extra work, I might look at the target date retirement fund, see what it's made up of, and say, okay, I'll put stocks in my Roth and the other, and then a combination of the other stuff in my traditional um, to grow the Roth as much as possible. That's my way I think through it. So Marla says, thanks for the live session. Question, by the way, I'm almost at the end of your, your, all your chats. And there's still 137 of you sticking around. God love you. You guys are gluttons for punishment. I haven't even gotten to a chess problem yet. Here, I'll put one up while I read Marla's question. I'm going to put up a, a diabolical one. Hang on. Marla, I'm getting to your question in just a second. So this is a tool I use called Chessable. Let me log in first, if I can. Oh, here we go. And it's not letting me log in. Well, maybe I have to go to chess.com. Why is it not letting me log in? Oh, here we go. And we're going to use uh, this one, Endgame Tactics. There you go. Can I make it bigger? I don't think I can make it bigger. Oh well. There it is. Um, it's, uh, look, how hard can it be? There's, each side's got five pawns. No, I guess white has six. Black to move and win. 
How hard can that be? All right, Marla, to your question. I wish I could make it bigger, by the way. I don't think I can. Oh, wait. Oh, wait, maybe I can. Oh, there we go. Oh, now you guys have no excuses. None. All right, Marla, thanks for the live session. Question, can I contribute to a Roth IRA for my spouse who does not work and has no own retirement account? I'm a, I am a high earner more than 250000 So that's a great question. Um, and I will tell you, being totally honest, I don't know the answer off the top of my head. There is such a thing as a spousal IRA. I know that much. I've never had one, and I've never sat down and figured out the rules. And, um, and it's basically kind of what the name suggests, right? It's an IRA for a working spouse who, who contributes on behalf of a spouse who earns little or no income. Normally, you have to have earned income to contribute. This is sort of an exception. What I don't know, because your question is specific to a Roth, right? Yeah, I don't know if... if, if... Well, let's do this. I think you can. According to Investopedia, you need to earn income to contribute to a Roth IRA, but if you're married, you can use a spousal Roth IRA to boost your retirement savings potential even if only one spouse works for pay. There you go. I think that's right. Obviously, when you go to open it up, you'll have to talk to the folks. They can confirm it. But I've never done that before, so I have no experience with it. But I knew enough to know there was such a thing as a spousal IRA. By the way, Alan is saying king to e3, so that would be moving this king right here to that. Oh, no, king can't go e3. I think he might mean d6 right here, because this is from Black's perspective. All right. Oh, yeah, yeah. and someone said king d6. That's, that's, that's the suggestion. Oh, look. Do they have the answers? They have the stinking answers. Oh, this is because, hang on, I'm gonna skip this. Okay, sorry about that. Do you see the answers? It was C4, but this one's even easier. Each side only has four pawns. Now, how hard can that be? Sorry about that. All right. Yes, Martin, I've read, it's been many, many years, a random walk down Wall Street, excellent book. Scott mentions VFSUX is a great place to, to fund, to park cash, all right? VFSUX, which is, huh. Yeah, it's, it's Vanguard short-term investment grade fund, all right? It's a good one. Frank says, just finished your book. It was great. Wife is 51. I'm 64. Any major obvious concerns because of the 13-year age difference? Um, yeah. Sure. I would be, you know, if, if that were the case for me, it's not. I would have to I'd be thinking through things like, you know, part of it depends on who's the provider. Maybe you both work. Maybe only one person works. Who manages your investments? But like in our case, um, I've done the majority of the of earning the income, not all of it, but the majority, and I manage our investments. So I would be thinking along the lines of what do I need to do um, to help my wife if I'm gone? Um, I would think through Social Security strategies, um, possibly waiting until I'm 70, but you know, you can pay someone to do the analysis for you. Um, involving, if, if, if your wife is not involved in the investing, getting her involved as, as much as she's willing because the day might come when she's handling it. Um, so yeah, there are a lot of things I would think through like that. Basically, will she be okay when I'm dead? Sorry, by the way, Frank, not to be so morbid. I mean, 64 is the new 48, right? I mean, so you're good.
I don't know, Michael. Michael says, with a Roth, you miss out on the extra money time in the market you get from the tax deference. Mad Scientist has a lovely graph showing the difference. My hunch, though, is the vast majority of people don't actually invest the difference. And if you, if you max out either way, do people really take the tax savings and invest it? I mean, they might. I mean, at the end of the day, if your tax rates are identical and you don't max out, you know, then there's no difference between the two, right? If you do max out and you invest the difference, in theory, there might not be any difference. But of course, when you're investing the difference, it's in a taxable account and you're likely paying some taxes year to year. So there could be a difference. But they're very similar, right? Passing through loves fat as a tick. Oh, my mom has all kinds of, she, you know. What's one of the things she says? If, if a hog was rooting you, you wouldn't yell suey. It's something like that. I still haven't figured out what that means. That's a Southern thing, I'm pretty sure. Although we grew up in Ohio. Deke says, I'm investing 90% of my income. 90%? It's unbelievable. In a 100% equities portfolio and want to retire early. No debts. Fire guy here. Well, I, I wish you the best. Curious your thoughts on FDGRX. Going to have to move away from the chess puzzle. I don't know what FDGRX is. Fidelity Growth Company. Eighty-three basis points. It's a large growth. Um, I would be curious how the fees affect it. If I were looking at this, I would compare it to a low fee Vanguard option, like a VUG. Um, I mean, I'm guessing this is. Yeah, I mean, you look at the top holdings. All of these funds are basically investing in the same thing. Which one's going to outperform? There's no way to know over a given period of time. I'd probably personally go with a lower fee option. Go back to this chess puzzle. Eventually, I think, by the way, it makes the move for you. I can give you a hint. It's probably dealing with how you can get a passer, meaning one of these white pawns pass to the black defense so that you can queen. Get a pawn to the back rank there and make a queen. So my first look, my first consideration is moving this pawn. That could be wrong. It could involve moving this one first and then this one. I don't know. Anyway, back to money. Dan loves Chessable. Yeah, if you're into chess, it's a great site. He says Magnus is best at end games. Yeah, well, Magnus is best at everything when it comes to chess, right? But his end game knowledge is unbelievable. By the way, if, you, if, you don't, if you're not into chess, and I'm sorry if the chess stuff, you know, bores you, but you can get the simplest position with just each side having one pawn or two pawns, and the answer, the, the, the proper play can be unbelievably complex. So Mr. Tyler to you says, have you read Wade Fowle's new retirement planning guidebook? No, I haven't. And I want to read it. So if you don't know who Wade is, he's a, a professor and has done a lot of research on retirement planning. And he does have a new book. Um, let me pull it up real quick. Here it is. And I, I do plan to read it. Um, if I can just find the, the table of contents. What is this? Here we go. He goes in, this is a pretty, you know, serious book. He goes into a lot of things, like you see Medicare and health insurance, long-term care planning. So, um, I don't know, you probably can't read that very well, can you? Yeah, anyway, it's a good, it definitely it's on my list to read. All right. Love Lyle says, I use a target date retirement fund because I'm 26, so allocation isn't much bonds to begin with. 
But as I get older, I would do the same and slowly transition away from the target date fund. Yeah, I think, honestly, if I were going to use a target date fund, I would do the exact same thing you've just described. But also keep in mind, you know, regardless of your age, you can put your money in whatever target date fund you want. Even if you're going to retire it in 2030, it doesn't mean you have to use a 2030 fund, right? Tom says, if I, roll, if I roll over a Roth 401k to an existing Roth account that is six years old, does the five-year rule start over for the rollover funds? Now, Tom, I'm going to give you what I believe is the answer, but understand I'm not a tax expert and I could be wrong. So there's two five-year rules, right? The first one is just a regular old, you're contributing to a Roth IRA um, and uh, you, the, the account has to be open five years. Uh, you can always take out your contributions, right? Penalty and tax-free. So it doesn't apply to that, but earnings. And you might say, well, does that mean that I can take the money out, the earnings from my contributions out after five years, even if I'm not 59 and a half? And the answer is no. Uh, there could be 10% penalty and other, other taxes, right? But, but you have to meet the five-year rule. That's true even if you open the account for the very first time at age 58, right? And the, 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 the rationale behind it is they want, they, the government, wants you to use a Roth IRA for long-term investing. But here's the thing. Once you've met that five-year rule on one or Roth IRA account, you've met it for all your Roth IRA. You could, have, you could own 15 different Roth IRA accounts. If you've met the five-year rule, you've met it. Now, for conversions, say from a traditional IRA to a Roth IRA, they have their own unique five-year rule. So remember, when you convert, if you owe any taxes, you know, because it's tax deferred, you're going to pay on the conversion. Um, you, you know, you're going to pay on the conversion, but you still have to wait five years before you take your money out or you'll get hit with a 10% penalty. If you understand the rationale, the rule makes sense. The idea is this. They want to prevent people from do, using the conversion as a way to get around the 10% penalty for a traditional IRA. So let's say you're 40 and you think, I'm going to take my money out. I know i got to pay taxes, but I want to avoid the 10% penalty. I know I'll convert to a Roth because I've heard you can always take out your contributions penalty and tax-free, and this is kind of a contribution. It's a conversion. So I'll pay my taxes on the conversion. i got to do that. But once I get it to Roth IRA, I'll take it out and, ha-ha, I've tricked the IRS. I've gotten around their 10% penalty, and the IRS says, hey, not so fast. We, we kind of foresaw that, and so we've instituted a, new, a second five-year rule that just applies to conversions. And unlike the, the first five-year rule we talked about, that once you've satisfied it for one account, you've satisfied it for all, not with this one. You've got to satisfy it for each individual conversion it has to satisfy this rule. And that's the idea behind it. They want to avoid people trying to sneak around and, and avoid the 10% penalty, which means if you turn, if you, if you do the conversion at 58, once you turn 59 and a half, you can take the money out. You don't have to wait the five years for the conversion five-year rule. Because remember, it's, it's, to, it's to prevent people from you know, getting around the 10% penalty, but once you turn 59 and a half, there wouldn't be a 10% penalty. Whew, I hope that makes sense, and I kind of hope I'm right, and I think I am. Um, so to answer your question, I, this is a rollover. So I think once you've set, met the five-year rule on, the, on opening the account in the first place, which you have, I think you're okay. But again, I'm gonna have all kinds of qualifications on that. I would talk to someone to make sure. All right, we're going to add, look, they already made the move. Look, I told you they make the move after a while. Salty had guessed G5. According to the computer, that's not correct. These are tricky. It's this. And um, now what's the follow-up? The follow-up's got to be this, right? Because the idea is you want to play G5. If, if, if black takes with this pawn, then this pawn queens. But if he takes with this pawn, you're stuck. But if you've got g4 in first and he takes with this pawn, you can take back and you're going to queen. So that's my guess. Now, this is where it gets interesting because the king is racing over to help. Um, but this king can't leave this pawn. Like I, I can't bring this king over here, or the, this black pawn or queen. I could take it, but that's going to take me two moves. If I go here, he goes there. Yeah, I'm still guessing that's the answer. And then this. Now, 
this is where it gets tricky. If I go here, I'm pretty sure that's it. But now this is where it's tricky. I don't push because then he can go right here and take my little pawnies. Instead, I go here. Yeah, and then I, I win this pawn. Then my king can come over and deal with this king and the pawn and get one of these guys to queen. Um, anyway, all right. <laughs> oh, yeah, and I realize you're not even seeing the board. Shimony Christmas. We'll go back. So it's, it's that, 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 and then that, but then you got to wait. You can't push this pawn. You got to collect this black pawn first. And actually, it also has a cool um, analysis board you can open up. And it shows you white to win and all the different moves white can make. Or all the all the the moves black can make, but will still lose no matter what they do. Like here, and then it shows you white can win with all of these moves. It's pretty cool. All right, enough chess. Thank you for your patience. Akeem, what are your view on fintech stocks? Well, I like them. I mean, I, I don't like them in terms of investing in them in an individual stock. It depends which one it would be, um, but they they're usually too expensive for my taste. Curtis says, I recently found your channel. I enjoy your approach and how you present info, even though you're a Buckeye fan. LOL, boiler up. How do I block Curtis from the channel? Let me see here. No, just kidding. A boiler maker. Well, everyone is welcome. <laughs> and I'm guessing that trash talking this year is not something I'm going to be doing. <laughs> um, So Marla, on the pro rata rule, depends on how much you have in your traditional IRA, but it, it may not be. That's, that's one of the reasons we don't do it. Mark, I, I don't know the answer to your question. Mark asks whether an expat can contribute to an IRA while earning all my income abroad. I don't know the answer to that. Quincy, I'm interested to hear some of your goals with your investments, buy a second house, travel, etc. cetera. Um, it's a great question. Here's the reality is we spend so little money relative to what we have. And my wife and I have talked about this. Like, should we spend more? Should we travel more? I mean, we travel some. We're just not, I don't know. You know, it's what? It's a Thursday now afternoon. I've been live streaming for two and a half hours. This is what I find fun. And it doesn't cost me anything. I don't, you know, I don't know. Gonna give a lot to charity, I guess. I'm actually gonna bring bring this live stream to a close soon because I'm exhausted and hungry. Huh. Lee says, when did you start investing through backdoor IRA? I am 35 and just found out about the backdoor last year and sad about many years that I missed out on a great investment opportunity. It is, it is bad. I've never done a backdoor Roth IRA, actually. And again, it's because I've got too much in pre-tax. I see all the chats about the chess problem, including that you couldn't see it for a while. Sorry about that. And yes, Woody was right. You're supposed to imagine the board in your head. I was taking chess lessons from a, a Hungarian grandmaster, and I, I thought about picking them up again. But one of the things he would do was, um, this is all via Zoom, and he would, um, this is not the only thing we did, but one of the things he would do is read off chess moves. So like he'd say, okay, we're going to do a chess game. So it's E4, E5, F4, uh, EF, Knight F3, you know, and, and usually it would be like 10 to 12 moves. And I couldn't use a board. I'd have to try to, you know, and then what's the, what's the way to, for white to win? And it's, I would, I could answer them. I got them. It wasn't easy for me. And it's a good, it's a good drill. So here's a question. Um, can you advise your 
what's your opinion about converting VFINX to VU in a brokerage account? Um, well, we know what VU is, right? That's Vanguard's S&P 500 index fund. VFINX is, oh, I see. That's their, yeah, so that's their mutual fund version. I just don't see a big difference. I don't, I guess the question would be why. I mean, you know, the expense ratio, I think, is one basis point lower. I've got mutual funds. Well, I have ETFs, too. For those kinds of investments, those large index funds, I just find it hard to form an opinion about feeling strongly one way or another. So... Um, that's my take on the whole ETF versus mutual fund thing. It, it, there are some styles of investing that would require you to use an ETF because they're just not available in mutual fund form, but in any event. Um, I, generally, uh, I just, I'm fine with, um, with mutual funds. But it also depends on where you're holding the account. Like if, you know, for accounts, if I'm going to buy a Fidelity fund and I'm not at Fidelity, I'll probably buy the ETF. Um, well, that's it for today's stream. Any chess players on chess on chess.com? Uh, because I'm looking for players to play. This is a great um, game. I think I mentioned. Um, uh, you try to solve as many puzzles in five minutes as you can. My record is 35. Um, but even if you're not a chess player, I think it's a sort of a great way um, to just kind of keep your mind fresh. Um, it ain't easy. Um, and in fact, why am I stumped on this one? This should not be hard. I guess I take the bishop and then win the queen. So I highly recommend this just to kind of keep mentally fresh. Anyway, um, that's it. All right, everybody. Remember, no live Q&A next week, but I, um, I will be back in two weeks. So have a good one. Until next time, remember, the best thing money can buy is financial freedom so you can just sit around on YouTube and play chess all day long.